Hello, welcome to Faith and Friends, and hello to November. I can't believe we're looking at the 11th month already. Mark, is it okay to sing Christmas music yet? Are we in Canada? <laughs> Do they celebrate Christmas differently than us? No, are we in Canada? It's because they've already had their Thanksgiving, haven't <laughs> ding, they? Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> it is not after Thanksgiving unless you are watching us in Canada, which through the power of the internet you might be, but... As long as you're not in Canada, it is too early to play Thanksgiving music because it is not after Thanksgiving. So, so what do you never moving to Canada, I assume. <laughs> what about what about all the Christmas music that's already being played in the stores? That doesn't count. That doesn't count. I try not to go in stores. Except our fine sponsors for all TV44 programming. I like those. <laughs> well, pretty soon you're going to go into stores. <laughs> it's going to be darker, depending on when you go in, because this is the last week of daylight savings time. We are going to fall back one hour on November 6th at 2 a.m. Now, if you have clocks that need to be set, don't forget to change the time before you go to bed Saturday night. But if Mark would have his way, we would never be changing clocks, right? I would have to agree with that, but we don't need to get back on that soapbox <laughs> this week. It's not the time for it. Well, all right. Although we do have an extra hour to talk about why we shouldn't have an extra hour. <laughs> and if you would back. like to talk to Mark, his Twitter handle is Mark A. Kuntz, and I'm sure he would happily have a conversation over Twitter with you on it. Absolutely, 140 characters. Keep it nice and concise. Hail some familiar <laughs> faces returning to Faith and Friends today. With the holiday travel season just around the corner, Dr. Trudy Pieper joins us to talk about simple but important ways you can prepare yourself to stay healthy during any upcoming plans. Also joining us today, Dave and Tracy Sellers from Vows to Keep Marriage Ministries. But first, let's take a look at our scripture. Let's do it. We're talking about healing. With all of our knowledge, Dr. Trudy recognizes Jesus as the ultimate healer. That leads us to Luke chapter 8, verses 43 through 48. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me, Jesus asked. And they all denied it. Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that power has gone out of me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all those people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. What an amazing story of faith from this woman who had gone through so much turmoil. She just knew if she could touch the cloak of Jesus, she could be healed. And, and he felt that power go out of him. Just an amazing story of, of Jesus' humanness and yet Jesus being fully God in that moment and having compassion on this woman who was hurting. I always find it's amazing to think about that story. 12 years, 12 years she dealt with that. Probably how many times did she think, there is no hope for me, there is no cure, this is what I'm dealt with forever, but yet just one brush up with Jesus changed it. And that's how, that's how Jesus is in our lives. Well, it also it illustrates the power of Jesus. Not only that just a simple touch could heal her, but the fact that he knew, he knew that the power had gone out from him, that it, that healing touch had been applied to her. Just, uh, just another example of the omniscience omnis of our Lord. We are counting down the days to the November election. It is just a couple days away. Up to this point, there have been a lot of emotions, accusations, in some cases, loss of friendships over this year's presidential candidates. What, however, can be done in a positive force in these final days? Pro-life advocate Dr. Alveda King and Pastor Michael Anthony, founder of GodFactor.com, are encouraging you to participate in the National Week of Repentance, which is being observed this week, October 30th through November 6th. Pastor Anthony says America needs a bath. Fear, hatred, moral decline, racism, financial instability, a leadership void. All of these are symptoms of a deeper problem, our spiritual dryness. Now the idea of the National Week of Repentance comes from 2 Chronicles 7, 13 through 14, which says, if my people who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. It's free to take part in the National Week of Repentance. Live stream video messages are taking place at www.revivalmatters.com. If you are not able to participate via the website, we encourage you to deliberately keep America in your prayers this week. Second Chronicles 7, 13 and 14 includes a key word, if, if my people will humble themselves, pray and seek God's face. 
God makes many promises in the Bible, but also required action on our parts. And in these final days before Election Day, November 8th, when our next president is decided, daily commit our country to the Lord, specifically that the people in this country would desire to do exactly what Second Chronicles is asking us to do. Again, that website, www.revivalmatters.com. This week is the National Week of Repentance. Well, you've heard of strawberries, blueberries, raspberries, blackberries, but how about elderberries? In fact, elderberries could have some components in your life that could help you not only down the road, but also in the days to come. Dr. Trudy Pieper, naturalist from Johnstown, Ohio at Phoenix Wellness, joins us again on Faith and Friends. Hello, Trudy. How are you this morning? <laughs> how am I? Yes. I'm, um, you know, I, honestly, I just got back from some trips where I flew in airplanes and I needed this information from Trudy back then because what did I get? I got a cold, I got a sickness. I needed elderberries along the Yes, you did. This, it's really exciting. A new study just came out, Jennifer, that's, you know, most people have colds. Most people have two to three colds a year. And um, so you get that from being in a close environment with other people, but particularly travel is very, very hard and most people end up with a cold. So they did a randomized, randomized double-blind study with placebo group uh, with two, 312 passengers, economy passengers, on an international flight to see if elderberry would make any difference. The great news was using elderberry made a huge difference in their health, and those people who took the elderberry had uh, fewer colds, fewer days if they did have a cold, and fewer symptoms. So how do we find elderberry? Capsule form, liquid form, what is it? Uh, elderberry is also called Sambucus. A lot of people find that's the Latin name for it. And it, it, for kids, it, you usually find it's a syrup. It's because it's, mm -hmm. it's very sweet. As you can remember, you talked about strawberries and blueberries. Elderberry has a very sweet flavor. So you can get it in that form. It also comes in capsules. Um, you can get the berries themselves and make tea if you want to be really creative about that and drink that. Um, it, the, the important thing about elderberry is that you want to do it in advance of your travel. So if you were traveling and you just started to say, oh, I'm going to take elderberry today, as this trial did, they only did it for four days, the day of the travel and four days afterwards, and they still had significant results. But I like to tell my patients, you, two weeks prior to travel, make sure you get out your elderberry, take a dosage of that, uh, usually per bottle or whatever their uh, manufacturer recommendations are, but combine that with some probiotics because we okay. know that probiotics will also help you uh, ward off any illness. It seems like such a simple thing, but yet somehow doing some of these simple health things could be very difficult to get into our lives. So just, would you suggest go to the store, go to a health food store? What's, what's the best way to make sure we have the right product for us? You know, health food stores, um, particularly in this area, you have some really good choices of, of places to go. I think that the people who work at health food stores have a wonderful knowledge of that. But if you want to go online and buy elderberry, that's very easy to do also. And you'd want to get something that's at least 400 mill. the study used 400 milligrams a day. Okay. So look for something that has 400 milligrams a day. And with elderberry, as opposed to taking some over-the-counter products, there are no side effects. Mm. So you don't have to worry about headaches or anything that will, a lot of times will come along, dryness of mouth. Um, not being able to sleep at night. Sometimes it causes irritation when you buy over-the-counter drugs. You don't have those with the elderberry. That's good news, definitely. Is there any reason for this to become a regular part of somebody's supplemental diet, or is this really something to hit hard when you know we're getting into this immunity compromise situation? I think you need to be aware that if you're going to be in a situation that you need to be prepare yourself. You need to be very intentional about making sure that your health is the best it could possibly be. Elderberry, echinacea, uh, golden seal are all three immune building herbs. But you sh I find that you, you can use them on a regular basis, but they lose their potency. Mm. So it's best to use them for no longer than six weeks at a time and then switch off to another, uh, another herb if you want to continue to build your immune system. All right, very good information. Elderberry as a key traveler friend, your traveler's best friend, Dr. Trudy likes to say, two weeks before your travel plans is when you want to start out with that elderberry um, into your, your system and not more than six weeks. You want to switch off to something else. Of course, if you're thinking, what did she just say? What was that? You can go back and watch this interview again on faithandfriends.wtlw.com and you can write down all of this key information 
Dr. Trudy Pieper from Johnstown, Ohio, Phoenix Wellness Center. We're so appreciative for all of your information. And um, if people want information about what you do, they can go to your website, Phoenix Wellness for you. you. Dot com. The number four, the letter U, dot com. And we want everyone to have a joyous expectation of what God's going to do through them. And keeping your health is one of the most important things you can do. That's right. And we're about wrapping up. But you just mentioned something I think is so important, what God wants with our health. And that is the key, isn't it? God it, wants us to be healthy. He wants us to, to thrive. You know, we're in, to be tired of being tired all the time is not the way he, his expectation for us. And just by making intentional choices, we can honor God with our body and do the things that's going to help us be able to do his work in our lives. Absolutely. Excellent information. Thank you, Dr. Trudy. My pleasure. You know what goes great with a glass of milk? Packing an Operation Christmas Drought shoebox. Okay, let's be honest. Packing an Operation Christmas Drought shoebox can go great with anything. It's so that other kids can learn about Jesus. Praise the Lord. Oh, and it's also a great way to teach your own kids about giving. Teach your kids about giving. giving. Have a great day. Oh, and don't forget, make good choices. So basically, you get an empty box, which any box will work. Really? OK, not any box. Much better. OK, so now you have your empty box. Now you can pick the age range, and if you want it to be for a boy or a girl. OK, come on, please be a boy. Please be a boy. Well, looks like we're going to be packing for a boy this year. First, you can choose a wow item, such as a soccer ball wow! or a stuffed animal. Mm. And you can choose other fun toys, too. Hygiene items oh, and school supplies. There are, of course, some items you cannot pack, like liquids, food, items related to war, live animals, and don't even think about packing chocolate because it melts. When your gift is finished, you can write a letter and include a photo. It gives it a nice personal touch. When your box is done, you can make your $7 shipping donation online through Follow Your Box. Simply print off your tracking label to see where the destination of your gift will be. And don't forget, it's important to pray for the child that is receiving this gift. Because packing a box is a simple way to share the gospel with kids all around the world. Maybe even in Nib in Africa. Now that your box is done, it's time to get moving. Transport your box to a nearby drop-off location near you. These will be open all across the U.S. on National Collection Week, the third week in November. Drop it off and voila, you pack the shoebox. Easy as one, two, three. If mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Ever heard that phrase? Well, you may be laughing about it, but what does it really mean and what kind of impact does that have on a marriage? We're pleased to have David and Tracy Sellers from Vows to Keep Marriage Ministries joining us again this week. And we are uh, talking about some common phrases that we hear in marriage, but let's dig a little deeper and really see what, that, what we're really saying. Definitely, this is a phrase I've heard over and over in my life. I've heard people use it. I've used it, mm -hmm. I've thought it, but I never really looked at it from a biblical perspective. So that's what we want to do today. Just find Great. out, is this something that we can back up scripturally or is this something that we've kind of come up with on our own? Because I really do hear this phrase inside the church and I hear it outside the church. So we want to examine it and see, are we using it to our own benefit at home? Because mm. I think that I do that sometimes. As a woman, I hear the advice all the time, you know, ladies, take care of yourselves first because when you do that, then you're going to be happy and then you can make everyone else happy. So we're going to examine that as we talk today. And I think one of the really important points we want to make um, as we're starting to unpack this, um, this phrase is that nothing we're saying is negating the fact 
that men need to be engaged. Mm -hmm. They need to be anticipating and looking for ways they can be involved in their family. They need to take seriously um, the role they have to to really support their family and to you know take charge within their family. So no, nothing we're going to say today would, would negate that. But but I think where it goes awry is when we start demanding that we be put number one, that mm -hmm. our needs be put number one, because can't you see that I'm working so hard and you've got to do this, you've got to hop to it because this is what I want. I'm going to be happy when I get that, so let's get going on it. And we start demanding and we let our unhappiness be shown and that demand sets in and it sets up a cycle that's hard to break. I think um, uh, unlike any other kind of premarital advice um, that, that's given out there, this is one of those phrases that's given very commonly and is generally accepted. And it's risky because um, that phrase, when mom ain't happy, ain't nobody mm -hmm. happy, um, it, it actually doesn't have very good biblical support for it as we're gonna dig into. But a lot of times, you know, we've heard of couples that have gone to psychologists that say, hey, man, help me with my marriage. And, and they would say to them this phrase and say, you need to take this very seriously. Again, I, I think it's important that we take, as husbands, take the role of supporting our wives very seriously. But we shouldn't do that out of threat or out of um, fear, but rather out of a deep love. And that's really something that no matter whether we're a man or a woman, whether we've had a, a Christian upbringing or not, whether uh, we've been married before or not, accepting some of these truths, some of these things as truth when they're really not, has some interesting implications for us. So I think when we think about where did this come from, why is it something we're so prevalently um, receiving and, and oftentimes applying, we, we, when, we still, when we really look at that, we really try to understand why, it's something we learn from experience. We can see in our marriages that when we have a wife who's demanding, um, a lot of times it's easier just to give in than it is to do anything else than to deal with the repercussions of it. We can make our spouse pay when they don't give us our way. And I didn't mean to rhyme on that, but it really is true. We let them know, hey, next time you better do what I want, otherwise you're gonna receive from me maybe the cold shoulder, or I'm gonna get angry at you, or I'm gonna withdraw affection from you. And I think we can do the same thing with our kids. Like they know as well, because we've been in a car together, we've been driving down the road, dad says, hey, where do you guys wanna go for dinner? And the mom says, pizza sounds good, and all the kids say, let's go get hamburgers. So the majority wins out, you go get hamburgers, and then you end up complaining the whole time about how bad the hamburgers are and how the place smells or whatever your complaint is, and you make the meal pretty miserable for everybody else. I've done that. I've made the situation, whatever it is, miserable because I didn't get my preference. And, I'll, you, uh, <coughs> excuse me, here's another example. You've got a messy house. I get very stressed out when my <laughs> house is messy. I don't appreciate that. And sometimes I can kind of go on the rampage, like everybody's got to get going on my agenda this afternoon. We're going to stop everything else. All we're going to do is clean. And I'm pretty miserable to everyone else in that time. And I'm very stressed out, I'm making them stressed out. No one else is happy because I'm not happy. You mean I can't, I, I can't do that? <laughs> <laughs> but then at the end of the afternoon, I have a clean house and I magically turn into this really nice person yeah. who says you know, to the child, let's play together. That's the child I just got done reaming out because the room was messy. The thing, those two things aren't matching up. If mom ain't happy, ain't nobody happy, and letting them know by experience that that is a true statement. It's something that both men and women truly buy into. I think it's something that just stems from the fact that we we all have this selfish ability within us, and when we don't get what we want, we of course are not happy as a result of that. But thankfully, God's word mm -hmm. compels us to really do the opposite of those things. When we love God, and that is what's motivating us, we see a completely different behavior out of us. It, it becomes a heart to serve. And that is something that is very, very addictive within a marriage. When you have a desire to serve, it becomes something mm -hmm. that your kids see. And, and that's critical, that's critical. You have this natural progression that happens and all of a sudden you begin to get your joy out of serving others. And it's not a temporal joy that you get when someone's serving you. It's a totally different mindset. Uh, I'm preaching to myself as we, as we talk about this because as I said, I, I mean, for me, I'm as selfish as, as anyone, but Jesus is asking us to model our attitudes after him. And I think if we look at Philippians 2, 
we see Jesus. He's laying down his preferences so much so that he gives his whole life. And that is, a, as a husband, what I'm called to do. We have to consider other, purpose, other people's needs more important than our own. And the end result of that is a true happiness. It's such a shift. It's a shift in our mindsets that we shouldn't be pursuing our own agendas. I think it's important to look at our family's happiness and ask ourselves the hard question, do we want our family's happiness to be based on our happiness? That's a tough one because I set that up as an agenda for myself, but is that really what I want for my family? Do I want them to finally be happy when I am? No, I want them to be happy because they can have a relationship with Jesus Christ and that brings ultimate fulfillment and it's not based on the life of pride that I've built for mm -hmm. myself. It's not based mm -hmm. on the tool of manipulation in this phrase. It's not based on that anymore. It's based on showing them that they can have true happiness outside of me and even outside of them. Yeah, I think if, if you see and you recognize that this kind of pride has been something that's driven your actions, and again, it's, it's not just mamas that have this yes. yeah. happen. Husbands are in the same place. I think it's so important that you let your family realize that um, you want to free them of that burden, that you want to help them to see that their happiness shouldn't actually be based on yours. And when you do that, the cool thing about it is that they actually learn that other people's happiness shouldn't be based on theirs, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So uh, it's, a, it's a cycle that repeats itself. They're watching, they're learning, and, and they're watching the example that we have. And when we set the example to, to, to be that we're the most important person in the room and everyone needs to know that, um, they quickly assume that themselves. So we lay down those rights, and I think it's an important thing to do. It can be, I think we can be selfish without realizing it. You know, happiness in the end is a, is a gift. You know, joy is something we should strive for. I always feel like happiness is, happiness is fleeting. Um, but the Bible is oftentimes, the, not oftentimes, it's always the key source to show us where we find that true happiness that we find. So as families are going through this and saying, I don't want to be in this cycle anymore, what are some scriptures that they can go to to help guide them through it? I think 1 Samuel um, chapter 8 has a great story in it that helps people to, to be able to see what the Bible would say on this subject. Israel has basically said to God, that we, we want to have a king to lead us, just like all the other nations around us have a king. That's what we want. And in this statement, they're basically saying to God, we don't want you as king. They're rejecting him. And they think that a king's going to make them happy. So God tells them, you know what? I could give you this king, but he's going to take the best of everything from you. Um, ultimately, you're going to come crying back to me and, and wish that you hadn't asked for this, but I'll give them to you if you want. And ultimately, they say, yes, we do want this king. And God gives them to them. And out of that, um, we see in verse 19, you know, what they're really looking for is they want someone to lead them. They want someone to fight their battles. When God gives it to them, they're unhappy. And the end result is, is unhappiness. And that is the same for us. We demand our way. We expect to have our preferences. And there's consequences to it. And those consequences don't result in us being ultimately happy. And in the end, no one's happy. That's why I think it's important at the end of the day, if we find ourselves unfulfilled, it's probably because we've been pursuing our own happiness. We haven't been having that shift into the Philippians 2 mindset of serving others like Christ served. We need to go back to Jesus and get our cue from him truly and say, God, how would you like me to serve tomorrow? Let's start over again tomorrow. It doesn't have to be like today. I don't have to put my family in that box. I don't have to bind them with this manipulation tool. I can free them by doing things your way instead. And like you said earlier, happiness is fleeting, but that true lasting joy, I believe, comes when we serve. It can be tough. It can be tough as a wife and as a mom to be in those situations. Mm -hmm. I wear a bracelet that says, be still, as a reminder to yes. try to stop myself from those right. crazy clean up the mm -hmm. house moments, because it can be difficult. But And I think if we find ourselves in that position, because it's going to come and it's going to sneak up on us pretty yeah. quick because that's our sinful, selfish nature. So if you're in the middle of that and you recognize that, that's number one, the Holy Spirit working in you to show you. He's tapping you on the shoulder saying, stop and do that. Be still. You know, that's great to have reminders like that. Maybe put something on your kitchen sink or your bathroom mirror, a verse that says, remember, when you're in the middle of that, you can stop right then and there. You don't have to finish it out. 
And then you can go to your family and say, I'm sorry for putting my preferences before yours. Let's do this together and let's do it to glorify God. All right, well, the key is mama can be happy and everyone can be happy, but we need to have God and the Bible as the key source. VowsToKeep.com is the website where you can go to find out more about the marriage ministry of Vows to Keep. Dave and Tracy Sellers, we're so thankful for this component of information and be watching in weeks to come because we have a lot more nuggets of marriage information coming as well. You can also hear more from Dave and Tracy by listening to WTTP here in Lima or Shine FM in the Bell Fountain and Kenton area and also on the outskirts of Lima. If mama ain't happy, nobody's happy, well, let's put God in the middle and that's where we true find, truly find the happiness. Well, coming up next week on Faith and Friends, Jennifer talks with the Executive Director of Drug Free Action Alliance. Tune in for Faith and Friends special, Fighting the Opiate Crisis, Awareness, Action, and Prayer. Expected topics include Ohio's opiate ep epidemic, the latest drugs on the market, fentanyl and carfentanyl, dealing with the opiate addiction, prevention, and what can the church and people of faith do to prevent and assist? To read more in the November issue of the Take One newsletter, expected to arrive in your mailbox this week. Finally now, we have arrived at our scripture once again, Luke 8, 43-48. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of Jesus' cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me, Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing around you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that power's gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could no not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been healed instantly. Then he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Maybe you feel like that someone today will know that Jesus knows what you're going through. He has the power to heal you. He is with you as well. Just reach out to him. Just that simple touch on his cloak could make all the difference. Have a great week.